Greetings and welcome to Bloomberg New Economy Conversations, where we explore how businesses and governments around the world are responding to the coronavirus pandemic. Today's conversation, Grounded, the future of travel, will dive into the world of business and leisure travel for a look at how the industry is faring now, how it plans to rebuild in the wake of COVID-19. When will the world start traveling again? Will demand ever return to where it was before? If so, when? How can we use the lessons of this pandemic to build a safer, cleaner, and more resilient global travel system. As usual, we've got an all-star lineup of speakers joining us today, so I want to get right to our discussion. As always, I'm joining you from rural New Hampshire, and I'd like to welcome our global community of Bloomberg New Economy delegates who've attended our forum in Beijing and Singapore these past two years. We also welcome the thousands of viewers tuning in on social media and via the Bloomberg terminal. There will be opportunities for real-time input from you, our audience. I encourage you to submit questions in the text box in the bottom right of your screen, and I'll invite you to vote in live polling in the top right of your screen. If at any point you encounter technical difficulties, a simple refresh of your browser should help get things back on track. Now let's get to our first interview. We'll start the program today with a fire starter conversation pre-recorded with the co-founder, CEO, and head of community for Airbnb, Brian Chesky. Like all travel sector companies, Airbnb's business nearly came to a standstill earlier this year as countries issued lockdown orders and communities around the world sheltered in place. Airbnb's business has begun to rebound though. I spoke to Brian about what he's learned from this experience. Take a listen. Brian, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for having me today. So you said in an interview last week that travel as we knew it is over. It's never coming back. Really? What, what do you mean by that exactly? Yeah, well, um, I think that there's been no moment in the history of travel, or at least not for the last probably 50 years, that has impacted the industry quite like today. And what I mean by that is, and I, I think maybe that's, uh, is the following. Um, right now, what we're seeing is a mass adoption of a different way to travel. Right now, people are not comfortable, um, writ large, getting on airplanes, crossing borders, being in crowds and lines. And what's gonna happen is what people are saying is they're comfortable getting in a car, traveling like as much as 200 miles, staying in small communities. And so what I think this is going to be is a new chapter for travel that's gonna be a little more intimate, a little more local. And I think you're gonna see travel getting more distributed to more communities. Because when you travel locally, by definition, you travel to more small communities. Now, it doesn't mean that the travel as we knew it, like all of it won't exist, of course it will. It's just that once people experience some other types of experiences, small communities, you can never undo that. It's always gonna now move towards a more intimate way. And this is something that frankly, everyone in the industry can um, participate in. I think it's actually gonna be, there's a silver lining here, though it's gonna be painful. I do think um, out of this is gonna be a new, uh, a new growth opportunity for travel. So destinations will change, as you say, people want to go to smaller communities. Yes, or but expand. People... It will be more of a democratization. So the, mm -hmm. the, the destinations that were winning before, I think they'll all recover. What's going to happen is people are going to realize that you don't just have to go to like 20 cities, go to the tourist district in those cities, get in lines and double-decker buses, stand in front of landmarks and selfies that that's not going away as much as that will be supplemented with an entire new way of traveling to small communities. That is pretty clear. Will, will people view home sharing differently? Yeah, I, I, I do think that um, you think of uh, the, uh, you know, it, it's like, this is all what's gonna happen in the future. People are um, spending months in their home. They're saying they wanna get out of their home they want to go somewhere, they want to get on a plane. And so what's happening is because there's not as many hotels in small communities and because hotels really don't want to operate without a reasonable occupancy, I think a lot of people, a new generation travelers are going to discover staying in a home 
And I think they'll find that as an appealing option for them. So I do think this is going to lead to a lot of people trying it. And I think that people are going to want for a while travel that's a little more intimate. And again, I think you will still see recovery of the old way of traveling. But I think even all of the traditional travel companies are going to continue to evolve to a more intimate way of traveling. And you're going to see them participate in more communities all over the world. So what this really means is that thousands of communities can now, I think, participate in travel. We call this kind of travel redistribution. And ultimately, even very large cities may welcome some of this. You know, I spent um, time in France. And I remember one time I met with the uh, Minister of the Economy and Tourism, and they told me one of the things they were interested in wasn't necessarily just getting more people to travel to Paris, but they wanted more people to go to Provence or the countryside or other parts of France. Um, parts of the United States, people are saying, uh, a lot of governors are saying they want um, people to visit more rural communities. We worked with uh, the state of North Carolina to promote travel throughout North Carolina, outside of cities, national parks. I think you're going to see a lot of outdoor travel, a lot of small communities. And once you discover it and you realize how fun it is, it's really never the same after that. So you, you talked about, about France. Um, some city governments are complaining that Airbnb forces up rents, changes the character of downtown areas. Ian Brossat, who's the Paris deputy mayor in charge of housing, said, we intend to take the opportunity to regain control. He was talking about the coronavirus. Do you worry about this kind of backlash or does the kind of travel that you've been talking about, a more dispersed democratic kind of travel, lessen that type of criticism, do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, I, th I think number one, we want to be really good partners to cities, including Paris, and there's many stakeholders, but we want to be a company that's strengthened the community in Paris. And I also think that like travel is going to probably be a little more distributed for a period of time. And one of the things we're trying to do is work with uh, DMOs, destination market organizations, governments that want travel. And so we want to basically partner with them. And then if people say they want more travel, we would love to be able to help market those destinations. So, and the vision would be, and I think this is a vision for all travel companies, is communities that want more travel, we can help um, promote their destinations. And that really, that would be ultimately a place to get to. Do you think the trends in work from home are here to stay? And if they're permanent, how will you adapt your business to meet the demands of this new nomadic workforce yeah. that can operate from anywhere in the world? That's a big part of your business now, right? Yeah, it, it's permanent, absolutely. But again, it's like a pendulum. If the pendulum was here and it's now all the way here, it's not staying here, it's gonna come back, but it's not going back to the way it was. Maybe that's another way of saying travel. Once people realize, and we have collectively realized, you can work from Zoom remotely and you work from a home. Not every person is going to go back to the office all the time. There's going to be much more flexibility. Companies are going to realize they can open the talent pool to communities all over the world. And what's also going to happen is I think work from home is going to become really like work from any home and people can start living different places month to month because if you don't actually need to go into the office, then you don't necessarily need to live in that place. And the place you were living may have been more expensive and maybe you live there for your job and now you'll have to make a choice to live there. And some people will choose maybe to live elsewhere. Maybe they're from another part of the world. Maybe they want to be closer to family. Maybe they want more space. So this is also going to lead to, I think, a little bit of at least a temporary population redistribution from mega metropolises towards perimeters. I think we're already seeing it. This is not the end of cities but it is like a pendulum. It's not gonna go all the way back right away to where we were because once people try something they like it, they don't go completely back to where they were. They, we kind of move forward. We don't, we don't go backwards, like we go forwards and you know, that's how things are gonna be. So how does this change the Airbnb business model? Well, I mean, you know, it, it does change the Airbnb business model, but it's not just the travel trends. It's also the constraints we have, you know, we like, every other company in travel were hit hard by COVID-19, really hard. We were hit so hard that um, we had to go through a very painful layoff. And when we had to do that layoff, we had to um, confront a very hard truth. And the hard truth is we can't do all the things we used to do. And you know, a crisis has a way of, um, you know, has a way of giving you clarity. And you ask yourself, you know, you know, I, I remember in the depth of the crisis, um, I got a lot of, we got a lot of support from people. 
And people said, like, we want Airbnb to pull through. We want Airbnb to, to, to kind of thrive. And I remember asking people, like, well, why do you want us to survive? And like, why do you want us to thrive, like, to exist in the future? And the answers that came up over and over again were that the part that was most special about Airbnb was really the reason we started Airbnb. Because we started Airbnb, it really wasn't about travel per se. I didn't intend to start, quote, travel company or real estate. It was really about connecting people and belonging. And that was really offered consistently, most consistently by everyday people that we call hosts that offer their homes or share experiences. And that's the roots of Airbnb. And so we're going to go back to basics. We want to get back to the roots, um, back to belonging, back to connection. And that is where we're focused. And it just so happens that communities around the world have hosts everywhere. And so it kind of does work with where the travel trends, but that's what we're focused on right now. Let's talk about practicalities. Um, it, there was a, a survey conducted by PwC in May. Travelers were asked about their perceived, uh, the perceived risk of certain types of travel. 54% said they thought staying in a short-term rental like an Airbnb was risky. How do you make the case now that it's safe for travelers? Well, you know, we've seen a, a quite different travel pattern. Um, if you search uh, Airbnb and Google Trends and you search other brands of Google Trends, I think the data is pretty public. You can just do the research yourself. I think what you're going to find is that right now, travelers, what they're saying is that they don't want to be in crowds. They don't want to be in public spaces. They don't want to be in lines. And what Airbnb provides is privacy. What Airbnb provides is intimacy, that you're not sharing space with other people. You get a space all to yourself. And you can get it not just in a big urban area, you can get it in a small community. And you don't have to get on an airplane to go to that small community. You can drive to that small community. So I'd make the argument to get in your car and go to a small community into a private space without a lot of people. I think that's actually pretty consistent with what people are looking for right now. International travel to many of the new economies around Asia, Africa, South America has ground to a halt. Right. Do you worry that Airbnb may lose market share to local competing platforms like Tujia in China that are used more frequently for domestic travel? Well, I mean, I, I have concerns, but my concerns are more for our host. I mean, Airbnb, no matter how hard like we're hit, we're going to be okay. I mean, we're a pretty big size company, I think. So our hosts, they're not all going to be okay. And what I'm specifically concerned about, so countries that have robust domestic travel, I think those hosts will be fine. So if, if a host in France, a lot of people in France who would have come to the United States, they're instead they're going to travel within France. They'll be okay. The communities that I'd be concerned about are communities that are communities built on tourism that you have to fly to and they don't have a huge domestic market. So these would be more like smaller communities, island communities, you know, so these are ones where, you know, we're, we're certainly concerned on behalf of our host. And, you know, I think it's going to be a, a very difficult period and we want to be able to try to help them get through this. Last question. What worries you most? Second wave, third wave of the virus, economic collapse, recession, depression, rising protectionist sentiment that might impact global businesses. What, what, are, you, what are you focused on now as, as the single biggest threat to the business? Well, I mean, well, what I'm most worried about isn't a specific threat to Airbnb, but I'll just, I'll just offer it, which is um, I saw a, a study, I think it was conducted by the University of Chicago that said that the number of Americans that self-identify as lonely or lacking companionship, I think it was like now close to 50%. Mm -hmm. And I think the combination of, you know, people being locked down, people being lonely, people not having companionship, people not having work, I'm pretty concerned about how like isolating, lonely, painful, scary, and harrowing this can be for an individual living at home or even somebody's trying to support their family. And I think that is very, very concerning to me. And I think ultimately we as a society are going to have to find ways to help reconnect people, to help, help them gain employment. I think, you know, the way to do that is we're going to have to create new jobs and new kinds of jobs and new ways to connect people because it's gonna take some time for the world to go back. And you know what, the world doesn't go backwards, it only goes forward. And so we're gonna to have to find, like together, collectively, as business leaders, and as an industry, how do we want people to live in the future? And I hope the way they start living is a way that gives more people opportunity, 
in more communities and reconnects people. Because the problem is the more digitally connected we seem to get, sometimes the more physically disconnected we get. The more we live closer to one another in cities, the more further apart we often feel together. If there was an opportunity out of this crisis, I hope that opportunity is one of reconnection to one another and opportunity in communities all over the world. On that note, Brian Chesky, thanks for your time. Thank you very much. That was Airbnb's Brian Chesky. Now let's meet our panel. It's my pleasure to introduce our three guests today. Shannon Knapp is the president and CEO of the Leading Hotels of the World, a 92-year-old New York-based organization representing more than 400 properties in over 80 countries. Shannon, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Andy. Arnold Donald is the president and CEO of Carnival Corporation, a British American cruise operator with a combined fleet of over 100 vessels across 10 cruise line brands. Welcome to the program, Arnold. Good day, Andy, everyone. Paul Griffiths is the CEO of Dubai Airports, which operates Dubai International, uh, 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 Dubai International DXB, the world's busiest airport for international passengers. Thank you for being here today, Paul. Great pleasure, Andy. So before we get into big questions about the future of the travel industry, I'd like to ask, get your reaction to a piece of news that just came across the Bloomberg terminal in the past few minutes, which is that the European Union is going to extend a ban on travelers from the United States um, for another two weeks while at opening its doors to travelers from China and a number of other countries. Um, Arnold, starting with you, how, how do you how do you look at that at that announcement? Not surprising, you know, the virus itself moved from east to west, so it's natural that you know the east is perhaps recovering sooner, and therefore Europe is more comfortable at this point with the levels of um, you know the spread of the virus um, east, and um, and obviously here in the west in the U.S. Um, you know, we're at a, um, a still at a peak or continue to peak in, in some locations here in the U.S. So it's not surprising. You know, a couple of weeks um, is, is um, not a dramatic amount of time. So we'll see what happens over time. Shannon, Europe is a huge market for you. Um, how much of a blow is this going to the European hotel business? I, I'm with Arnold on this. I mean, let's let's wait and see. But certainly, uh, it's unfortunate that the the ban has been a broad scale ban on U.S. travelers. I think uh, the U.S. makes is a very important part of the European uh, tourism sector, and you know, millions of uh, Americans travel to Europe every year. So it is my hope that this is not a protracted ban, uh, and that I, I know they're revisiting it in two weeks, and you know, by then hopefully we'll have a better grip on the, the outbreak here and, and we'll uh, be able to at least perhaps not um, a broad scale, you know, approval of all Americans that travel to Europe, but certainly I hope we're able to, with a validated test, um, with some kind of criteria, allow some Americans to um, head to Europe because quite frankly, it's going to be important to the European tourism recovery, the EU recovery. Um, and so I'm hopeful for uh, both the American travelers as well as uh, my colleagues and hoteliers in Europe that uh, this is a short lived ban and that will have a resolution uh, soon. So wait and see. Paul, you're in the Middle East. Nevertheless, this this uh, announcement really highlights, I guess, the fragility of um, of the economic, global economic recovery. Uh, it certainly does, Andy. And I think the thing is, provided the ban is based on the prevailing medical evidence, and let's face it, the virus is at a different stage of its progression in different countries, and sensible decisions are being made, then I can understand that because I think travelers at the moment are looking for medical security. And until that is secured with the virus in recession globally, one can understand why the propensity to travel is difficult and governments feel that they have a duty to protect their citizens. I think the difficulty of course, is that it extends then the social pressure and the economic pressure 
will intensify and we hope that the virus will have a number of primary measures to control it, namely a vaccine or similar digital tracing and tracking uh, program that will enable us to live with it successfully because I can see that if this goes on for a long time, the social, the economic and the medical uh, forces will start to conflict with each other and governments will be placed in a very difficult position. Okay, I want to put up a chart um, now, which you'll see on the screen, which shows the S&P 500 Resorts, Hotels and Cruise Lines Index, which I think is pretty illustrative of the travel industry's woes. That index is down 51% to date. I'd like our panel to, to put the scale of this crisis into some kind of a context for us. Have we ever seen anything like this, a collapse on this scale uh, before. Um, Paul, would you like to, to take that one first? Well, I, I think the airport and aviation industry has probably been hit even harder than your slide suggests. I mean, over the course of a few days in March, we literally went from 1,100 flights per day down to just 17. And we are now handling in four hours the, the sort of things that we would handle in four minutes before. So the dramatic descendants of demand for travel is, is huge. And of course, uh, an economy like Dubai is very dependent on the existence of very good quality uh, connections to over 260 cities around the world. So we are desperately interested to get our planes back in the air and our airport going again, but clearly the rate of that recovery is not driven due to factors which are entirely under any single party's control. And what we've got to try and secure here is some form of global approach so that we know that the testing regime and the security that we can offer to travelers is interchangeable across countries. Now, that's going to be a Herculean task to overcome because obviously, Governments are not used to working in that way in a time of global crisis. This is the first time, I think, that the supply chain, the demand, there's a medical risk to travel, and of course the economic impact of all of those things is, is dramatic. We've seen wars, we've seen uh, other acts that have constrained travel in the past, but not one that has every single element of the entire supply chain so dramatically affected. Arnold, your whole industry has come to a complete halt. Absolutely, it's unprecedented. Um, as you point out, our entire industry is not sailing. Uh, we've come to a halt when it comes to carrying guests, but we've been extremely busy these past many months repatriating crew in an environment that's you know very difficult to do so. Uh, we've repatriated over 70,000 crew members. We still have just under 10,000 still on our um, ships at sea that we're trying to get home. And so it's unprecedented. Um, we voluntarily paused. Uh, since then, the CDC has um, issued a no-sale order and renewed it. Um, going beyond that no-sale order, our industry in the U.S. has already um, extended our voluntary pause um, into September uh, already as an industry in the U.S. Outside the U.S., um, we're somewhat a little more optimistic. Um, we think there is the possibility um, for some uh, sailings to occur again in Europe. Um, Germany is engaged, Italy's engaged, Spain is engaged in taking a look at resumption of, of crews um, you know, for their domestic travelers uh, at this point. Uh, and so you know, that could occur possibly, but who knows in August or September. So it's unprecedented. We have um, uh, no revenue basically, um, but we still have to maintain our ships. And we still have, as I mentioned, thousands of crew um, at sea uh, that need to be tended to who are attending you know, to the ships so that when we're able to resume, uh, we'll be ready to resume. But it's, it's been um, absolutely devastating. I just want to point out with the others, I'm sure they say the same thing, but our highest responsibility, Andy, and therefore our top priorities are always compliance, environmental protection, and the health, safety, and well-being of our guests, 
of the people and the places we touch. In our business, I have nine Whirling Cruise Line brands. We go to over 700 um, locations around the world on all seven continents. So the people in those locations that we touch, uh, their health and well-being is a primary concern for us, as, of course, is our crew. And so with that in mind, we're totally focused as a company and as an industry in pursuing you know, the best interests of public health as we do eventually resume cruising. Where, where are you repatriating your workers to? What's the main source of labor for the cruise industry? And my uh, crew of over uh, 90,000 or so and, and told on when pre-COVID, um, we had representation from 145 countries. And so we repay trade all over the world. Um, we have uh, some concentrations in the Philippines, I'm in India and Indonesia, but also Central Europe, Caribbean, um, and everywhere in the world. So, um, so many borders were closed, airlines, as Paul mentioned, were, you know, shut down with very limited um, travel. Then there were issues around, you know, who could travel. And so it's been a, a very, very tedious process to repatriate. Shannon, have we ever seen anything like this before in the hotel industry? Uh, not in my experience and certainly reiterating uh, what my colleagues have said, I, the, the speed and the scale of the impact of this pandemic was uh, unprecedented is a word I feel like we use now um, almost flippantly, but it, it, it was truly unprecedented. I happened to be in travel um, after 9-11, you know, during the financial crisis, and I have never experienced the speed and the scale of uh, this pandemic and the impact that it has had. Uh, at, at its height, leading hotels, over 80% of our hotels were closed for business around the world. Uh, we're in over 80 countries around the world. So you can imagine um, just the, the devastation. And many of these hotels are generations uh, owned you know, by family and, and they're gems of their family and the personal hardships and the, the, the um, individual misery is, is what, you know, really struck a chord with me. Certainly we're all living through a global recession, um, devastating times without a question. Um, but the personal stories of, of our hoteliers and, you know, sixth generation owner of a hotel having to close their doors. And uh, it, it's really been an incredibly difficult time, uh, both obviously from a business perspective, professionally, but also personally. Looks like we're having a little bit of, of, of trouble with your um, audio, uh, uh, Sean. Uh, but let's get let's get to another question. Uh, uh, Brian Chesky predicts a future uh, for post-COVID travel that is more local, more intimate, and as a result, more dispersed. Briefly, what do each of you think is the one big trend that will reshape your area of the travel industry? Um, Arnold, um, let's start with you. Um, fundamentally, what Brian was saying, which is, is bringing people together. You know, people come to build lifelong memories to share with their loved ones, but also to meet new people. So whether it's, you know, guests to crew, crew to crew, guests to guests, guests to the locals and the location they go, is people discovering what they have in common with others so they can then learn to celebrate, you know, rather than fear the differences. And even though we have fabulous ships with fabulous features and wonderful, beautiful destinations, what most people will share when they come off a cruise is some personal experience with another person or other people. So in the end, we're all about connecting people and bringing the world closer together. And that's the foundation of travel, learning and discovering. And it's the foundation for crews. And I think that will be the essence going forward. You know, there may be some, you know, detailed changes, but keep in mind, in our business, we've had other viruses. Now, nothing like this. This one's clearly shut down the world. But, you know, we've had to deal with um, other viruses, whether it was SARS or MERS or Zika or whatever, and Ebola, you know, even more common things like measles and chicken pox and, you know, and so on. So we've had to deal with that, that sort of a thing. So there'll be unique things for some period of time, maybe forever, if this virus stays around forever. 
uh, that we'll have to deploy to address this particular health threat. Um, so there'll be some technical changes, but the essence of travel, the reason why people travel, um, the desire that they have to travel is there. And I can't tell you, you know, how warming and, and, and just how it fills our hearts to see the thousands and thousands of notes we get from guests who can't wait to cruise again, who are concerned about the crew members that, you know, they sailed with before and they knew about. And, uh, and that's the essence of this. It's really about people experiencing people discovering and learning to celebrate differences. Paul, one big trend that will reshape your industry, the airline industry, the airport industry. Well, I think what Arnold says is absolutely right. I think we've got to remember that there are nearly 4 billion people that have been or are under lockdown. That's half the world's population. And when I hear from people, the thing they miss the most is seeing people in three dimensions, not two. And actually, all of the social and economic things that travel promotes, you know, everyone's saying, is business travel dead? Are we going to be getting on airplanes to close deals? And I think the thing is, if we look in the past, there have been so many technical predictions about what technology would do to human behavior. And most of them have been incredibly wrong. I'm still looking for all this leisure time that technology was going to create by making my life easier. Now, of course, I'm watching those flashing lights on my phone and having to answer mail in the middle of the night. So I, I really think that the propensity to travel will remain very strongly intact. But I think once we've got the medical solution in place and we're going to have to develop a military style response to deal with this new threat in, in the future, once that is overcome and we've recovered public sentiment positively towards travel, people will be probably socially and economically in quite a fragile state. And what we will have to do is create new products that are much more value based to get people back on, on their feet and unite families and bring people together. So I think the question in the short term is about public confidence. In the long term, it's an economic one. And the difficulty, of course, is if you are seeing, as some airlines are saying, that they're going to limit occupancy on planes to just 60%. The unfortunate downside of that is that airfares will have to quadruple to cover the cost because unfortunately the cost of flying an aeroplane is broadly the same whether it is half full or completely full. So the economic impact, not just on aviation, but if you think about it, theme parks, you've heard from Arnold on cruise lines, all of those things are going to be fundamentally disrupted negatively through the economic change if we have to adapt to a post-COVID world that means we can't be more than two meters um, close together. So I think there'll be fundamental changes in the short term, but that will lead to a broader and more competitive product to face a new market in the longer term. Shannon, Paul talks about value proposition. You operate at the right at the, the top of the, the, the hotel industry value chain. Is that less prone to, to disruption, do you think, in the long term from some of these big trends? I think to some extent, yes, but to some extent, no. Again, the, the scale and the impact of this pandemic has spared no one, um, I, you know, I, whether it's Lux the luxury segment, you know, on down. So I, I feel like there is a significant disruption. But with that said, we know that luxury travelers are usually the first, luxury leisure travelers are usually the first to recover. Um, they're the first to travel. They have the pent up demand. They have the means to travel. Um, and so, you know, it, it continues to be my expectation and the expectation uh, of leading hotels that we will see that that luxury traveler out in front leading the way to recovery as we have seen uh, in the past. But certainly, you know, I know Brian talked a bit about this local authentic, smaller uh, desire for travel. And I think I 100% agree with him. In fact, this is a trend in loyal and luxury that we have seen uh, for, for many years now. And I see this expanding now, certainly um, to other, other segments of the market, but 
this desire for authentic travel, this desire to connect with communities, uh, this desire to leave the destination in a better in better um, shape than you actually found it. That's something that's been prevalent in the luxury industry now for, for several years. Um, and I'm excited to see that expand because I think um, part of what is beautiful about travel, as my colleagues have said, is the, the opportunity to explore, the opportunity to learn, the opportunity to expose yourself to, to things you, you haven't been exposed to before on the journey to um, self-improvement. So for me, the trend that we've seen in loyalty, this local, authentic, smaller, it's something that in luxury, I think, um, will expand to the other segments of the market. And I'm excited about that because I think it offers a tremendous amount of opportunity and starts to assist with some of these issues we've been seeing around over tourism in locations um, around the world. So if, if Paul is, if, if, um, if, 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 if the Brian Chesky is right about smaller and more intimate, and you think he is right, um, what does that do to the structure uh, of the hotel industry. It, it, does this put pressure on the big players? Are we likely to see smaller, more niche, more, more specialist players crowding into the sector? I think the thing that's wonderful about hospitality is it's so diverse and it's so broad and there are so many needs um, that can be met by each of the players. You know, we have been seeing the larger um, hotel brands move into the um, smaller, more authentic kind of collection type, boutique type um, lifestyle. There's all these different names for them, but we've been seeing that shift now for, you know, uh, about three years at this point. So it's something, again, that I think is is not that new as it relates to trends, but something that's expanding beyond that luxury um, segment. So I do, I do think we'll continue to see the larger brands push into this space, um, diversify, you know, holdings, make sure that uh, there are different brands and different experiences for different uh, guests. Um, but I do continue to believe in and champion uh, the independent luxury hotel. I do believe that this will um, this crisis creates a, a tremendous opportunity for the independent hotelier. Um, the level of creativity, the level of personal engagement, uh, the connection with the guests that an independent hotelier has uh, is hard to replicate in a branded kind of broad scale uh, manner. It's actually what makes independent hospitality such an incredibly special um, sub-segment of the luxury market. Um, so sure, I think we'll see some changes. I think we'll see a continuation of what we've been seeing from the, the larger brands over the last several years. But I believe there's plenty of space for the independent luxury hotel to thrive um, coming out of, of this crisis. Okay, uh, I want to bring in our first audience poll. Uh, let's see what our viewers think uh, when they're assessing levels of risk um, uh, pertaining to, to, to different types of, of, of travel. Question is, if trying to avoid an encounter with COVID-19, which of these seems riskiest? Air travel, hotel stay, Airbnb rental, or a cruise? And while we're waiting for the audience to submit their questions, we've got a question just came in. This is an interesting one from Jacob Wedderburn Day, who is the CEO of Stasher based in London. He asks, since lockdowns have highlighted the environmental impact of travel quite powerfully, how do we go forward in promoting travel while also promoting responsible environmental behavior? Arnold. I think you do just that. You promote travel and you and you promote responsible environmental behavior. And not only do you promote it, but you example it. You know, you exemplify it. And and I think that's exactly what you do. That there is a way to travel um, responsibly. Um, you know, in our case with cruise, who wants to go to a polluted location, or who wants to go someplace where the marine environment has been damaged or soiled or, or where their air is difficult to breathe. I mean, nobody wants to go there. So it's in the very inherent essence of our business that you know we stand for and we promote and we encourage and we educate um, and we help fund and source you know environmental responsibility. Uh, first of all, it's the right thing to do for all of us on the planet. And secondly, it's the essence of our business because people won't want to go if things are destroyed or polluted. So you'd have to do both. And um, I think they, we learn from the examples that you know people are discovering out. They see 
an example. We learn from it, adapt to it, and uh, make certain that, that we're living and traveling in a responsible way. Paul, do you, do you think concern for the environment in the long term is going to suppress demand for air travel? I think it's going to have an impact, and I think there will be two things. I think there will be a big modal shift, and I think governments, uh, governments globally are going to have to invest in more clean energy for short and medium uh, haul journeys that can actually replace air travel. The difficulty with air travel and sustainability, it is very, very difficult indeed to get an alternative fuel source for aviation because you have to carry your fuel with you and it has to be calorifically dense to be able to impart enough energy to keep an aeroplane in the sky. So that requires a huge amount of technical uh, challenge to be able to solve that particular problem. It's coming in the form of electric uh, aircraft, but so far only at the smaller end of the market. So I think the environmental uh, concerns have been amplified by what's happened through COVID-19. We've all been quite struck through the sight of kangaroos in, in Sydney, the satellite photos of the reduction in pollution in China and India, and of mountain goats in coastal towns in Wales. And I think that's really created some public sentiment, which will increase the focus. The one concern I have, though, is technology needs investment. And if we are fundamentally weaker as a global economy, we've got to find a way of making the investment in uh, sustainable travel sustained if the economy is fundamentally more weak and can't support that. So I think that's one concern I've got, but I'm sure this will increase awareness and demand for more sustainable ways of traveling by air and avoiding traveling by air if there are sustainable alternatives. So let's go to the results of our poll. I guess it's no surprise that um, a majority of people are nervous about um, getting back onto a cruise ship. It perhaps is a bit surprising to see that air, people think that Airbnb rentals uh, aren't quite as safe as staying in the hotel. I would have thought it was the, would be the other way around. You're in, in an Airbnb, you're in your own place, you control your own environment, it's a bigger space, you're not mingling with other guests. Shannon, does that surprise you at all? Um, it doesn't. And, and I'll, I think I agree with what you just said, Andy. I mean, I think those are components, but I think the challenge with Airbnb is that is the regulation of the cleaning that goes on between stays. And I think that's probably what you're seeing a reaction to here a little bit is, you know, with with hotel brands, certainly with leading hotels, there is a standard a protocol for, for cleanliness. And, you know, to the extent how is that being monitored at the the um, properties all over the world? You know, what is the infrastructure for ensuring that that's happening? Um, I think that you know, from a from a hotel perspective, we're all very focused on this. We've all rolled out uh, health and hygiene protocols. Um, we have means for monitoring, um, and I, I just I think that that's probably uh, what you're seeing in the response here with Airbnb is a little bit less of an uh, understanding of how that's being monitored how that's being kept up, how that's being checked stay to stay across the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of properties around the world. Arnold, the, the cruise industry is all about mega size ships, the, smaller, the, the, the size of small, small cities. Is there a smaller, more intimate model? Is it about, or is it more about new protocols like eliminating buffet lines? Is the, is the, only, is the only hope um, a, a, you know, a COVID vaccine or an effective therapy that restores things to where they were before? Look, I think, um, first of all, there is tremendous demand for cruise, even now. And, um, and it comes from those who are familiar with cruise and have cruised a lot, because what they know is when you talk about sanitation, um, a, number of, a number of the things that are being put in place now in hotels and other things have been in place for many, many years on cruise ships because we've had to deal with viruses before. So we, you know, you have hand sanitizing stations throughout the ship. You, you have deep cleaning and so on and so forth. So you have a lot of those things already in place. Um, this particular virus has unique characteristics. The epidemiology is still not well understood. It wasn't that long ago that people thought it might be being transmitted through HVAC systems. Now they say that's probably a low probability of transmission. Mm -hmm. Was that hard surfaces were concerned about the transmission? Now they're saying 
it appears that there's probably low incidence of transmission from hard surfaces. That's what the science is starting to say. So as you discover more and more, we'll figure out exactly what we need to do. And I would just tell you that with, with crews in general, that uh, the larger ships, you know, actually have lots of space. People talk about buffets. Many of the buffets, the food is already covered. You receive the food from a wait staff. You know, you don't take the food yourself. So then the question becomes, if social distancing proves to be the proper preventative measure, that, you know, you have to be concerned about the queuing of people to, to get the food. And so you just put the proper social distancing in place. We are a city at sea. We're a theater. We're a casino. You know, we're at restaurants. We have, but we have many restaurants on the ship, so we can distribute people, you know, to get, you know, distancing in restaurants. We can increase the number of shows and reduce the amount of time to create space in the theaters. If social distancing proves to be the preventative measure that allows people to feel comfortable living with the risk of COVID-19. So right now we're working with scientists around the world. You know, we have an advisory panel of, of medical professionals and scientists to really understand the epidemiology, the transmission, what really would be the best protocols to mitigate, you know, community spread. Because a ship is not just a form of transportation, a cruise ship. It is a city at sea. So when someone gets on a plane, where did they come from? Where are they going when they get off the plane? What happened in the airport terminal? When they get off the plane, what are they going to do? Are they going to a restaurant? Are they going to a hotel? Are they going to do both? Are they going to go to some entertainment venue? Are they going to go to a wedding? I mean, you know, so all of that activity is going on in a city and we're cities at sea. And so, it, you know, you have to compare crews more to being, you know, shoreside life for four, seven, five days, whatever it might be, than just to a mode of transportation because we're much more. Thank you. Well, a question coming in uh, for you. Um, it, this is from Chuck Van Kempen. He, he's a senior manager of sustainability at Geotab in Oakville, Ontario. Chuck asks, how will the cost of travel be affected by reduction of capacity on flights going forward? This is a good point. Uh, I mean, you know, is mass airline travel finished? Uh, if airlines are now forced to, you know, widen the seats, expand the aisles, add more toilets, generally accommodate themselves to a new, new era of social distancing, presumably ticket prices are, are, are going to, to, to rocket. Well, I think the thing is, it's not just the aviation industry, but just think about it more broadly. Theme parks, music festivals, restaurants, Arnold's talked about the cruise ship impact, you know, anything where space is a premium and space is actually the main product, which is what you're primarily selling on an airplane, is going to be massively impacted economically if that space cannot be sold in the same economic proportions that a person occupies. So I think the difficulty is going to be if you halve the capacity of an airplane, as I was saying earlier, um, and the aircraft still costs the same to operate, you're going to have to double the fares to generate the same break even. And the difficulty, as, as I think everyone appreciates, the aviation industry is not a fundamentally profitable industry. In fact, I think it's probably destroyed more shareholder value since 1903 than it's created. So airline economics are already pretty knife edge and the concept of physical distancing on aeroplanes, I just don't think is going to be economically sustainable at the sort of levels of travel that we've seen in the past. So if uh, airfares have to double to compensate for this, then the demand for air travel is going to collapse. So we would be in a very different world if there's no other solution to the problem of viruses such as COVID-19 other than spacing people apart. A lot of industries will be fundamentally changed by that as an outcome. So we have to find a primary method of dealing with the problem in my view. Let me ask, I have a question for you, Paul. We, we keep hearing about coronavirus, a uh, country setting up travel corridors, travel bubbles um, between neighboring countries or between small groups of countries. Uh, how, how does this work for a hub like Dubai that sits in the middle of a, of a, of a dense network of, uh, you know, it, it's, it's the hub of, 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 a, of a network of travel routes, right? 
it's going to be a big challenge. I can't deny that. And what we're working to do now is to get not just bilateral agreements country to country, but trilateral agreements, which will allow certain countries to connect through a hub through to their ultimate destination. And that, of course, when it's quite difficult to negotiate bilateral agreements on medical fitness to travel is going to be really quite a challenge. So I think where we're confident in the short term that the point to point model of travel between cities where countries are sufficiently confident that citizens of both ends of a particular route are going to be fit enough not to create a health risk if they are interchanging journeys between those two countries, it's going to be a bit more of a challenge. But I think what will happen is solutions will emerge. This may seem very challenging at this point in time, but once a solution does emerge, be it a medical one, a technological one, or some alternative. I mean, I'm old enough, sadly, to remember when we used to have to travel with little yellow books, which was the immunization record of uh, certain uh, diseases and, and different ailments that you had to demonstrate that you were uh, immunized against before you could enter certain countries. If we have a digital version of that, perhaps in the future, we'll just simply be able to travel from country to country, exchanging seamlessly these medical records so countries can be assured that people, when they enter the country, are medically fit to do so. So I think there are many possibilities of overcoming this with some clever, uh, intuitive ideas that the human mind, I'm sure, will come up with. And we will get back to a world that we do recognize. But until we get there, I think it might be a bit of a long road. And I hope that there will be a big hockey stick at the end because travel remains an aspirational commodity. And as I said earlier, half the world's population are in lockdown. And I'm sure many of those people are just desperate to go somewhere on holiday to see their friends in 3D instead of on 2D on a screen. Shannon, I want to put this question uh, to you. It's coming from Luke uh, uh, Jigwe, the founder and director of WYN Hospitality in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, and uh, uh, Luke Jigwe uh, asks, to what extent will the tourism of tomorrow continue to integrate digitization into the overall travel experience? I think we've reached a tipping point with digitization. I, I do believe that there are some processes and there are some um, uh, operational improvements that can be had through the digitization, even in the luxury experience. And, and let me be clear, luxury will always be a person to person exchange. So it's not like we're going to see, you know, rampant robots kind of taking over luxury hospitality. But I do think that there are certain processes that can be digitized. For example, I'm going to be out of my room uh, at the beach or touring the city. Um, can you please make up my room while I'm not there? Can we digitize that versus having to pick up the phone? You know, simple request. Can we uh, expand the, the mobile check-in capabilities? Are there things that we can integrate within the operational experience that is kind of the nexus of both operational efficiency as well as meeting uh, the luxury consumers needs. I think where we get, you know, the trick is to not over digitize an experience um, or over automate an experience because simply that won't be luxury. Um, but I do believe that we've reached an inflection point because consumers comfort level because of the capabilities available uh, that there will be an increase in the automation or digitization of certain certain operational um, processes that perhaps don't require the level of manual in, in, uh, intervention that we have today. So I'd like to put a question to all of you. At the Bloomberg New Economy, we're very focused on the developing world. What does this do to smaller countries um, that don't have robust healthcare systems? Do they just get wiped off the travel map? I mean, is the, in a post-COVID world, does travel favor larger developed countries with better healthcare systems? Arnold, you, you, you travel to, a, I mean, around the Caribbean to countries all over the developing world, some of your most popular destinations. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that, first of all, the demand for travel is to go to a lot of these places you're you're discussing and one of the biggest impacts of this has been in our inability to cruise 
you know, has been the economic impact on so many of these places that are dependent on tourism and in some cases solely dependent on cruise. You know, one job on a cruise ship is equivalent to, they say, five to seven jobs in a broader economy. But in some of these locations, it's their entire economy. And so there's major ramifications. So we, we want to find a way to be able to cruise and take people to those destinations. And I think that's the essence of it, that you will figure out how to, with public health in the forefront, um, their health as well as the guests, you'll figure out a way to be able to access those places um, in a way that's safe for people. And so again, as we learn more about COVID-19 and it's happening, all these different restarts and different approaches, there's so much data and knowledge that's being gathered in terms of what are the best ways to mitigate spread. And, and once that's well understood, it'll get executed and implemented. And, and even in some of these places where they wouldn't be able to handle if there was suddenly an onslaught of people you know, that um, needed to be hospitalized you know, for any reason, um, COVID-19 or any other reason. Uh, and so today, those, you know, we manage that and we'll manage that in the future with the appropriate management approach. You know, that's determined. You mentioned digitization real quick and I'll move on to the other panelists, but um, you know, that's another key aspect, even for the less developed places. Um, you know, we run the gamut from, you know, Seaborn, our ultra luxury lines, our mass contemporary lines like Carnival and Costa, and then our premium brands like Hollow America and Princess and, and Cunard. And on Princess, we have our ocean medallion which is just a little device. And this will come in really handy for people going to other places that we can take into destinations as well. But right now it's on, on a number of our ships in the Princess line. And what it does is it's like a license plate and every crew member knows who you are. There's portals throughout. You don't need a room key. You don't need anything. Your door recognizes you. Um, you go in the bar, they know who you are. They know what drink you like. You go out on the bow of the ship to see the whale. You're in Alaska and everybody sees yells whale and you run out. The drink will come to you. You can order food anywhere on the ship. It'll come to you. They know your name. They know it. You go into the gift shop. You take what you want. You walk out. It's automatically registered. So it's no touch, it's, um, et cetera. So that kind of digitization, if you imagine now you transfer that to, to land where people are disembarking and it stays no touch. Um, and people are able, th those are the kinds of things that will be solutions where there appears to be greater risk. We are rapidly running out of time. I I I'd like to get to a, a second polling question uh, before we completely run out of, uh, of time. Uh, if we could bring that one up. Okay, here, here we go. How soon will you feel comfortable traveling again. Your options are never. I'm homebound until there's a vaccine. I'd feel comfortable traveling locally where it's safe. Fire up the engines. I'm ready to see the world now. And the last option, I've already completed my first trip lockdown. As we wait for these poll results to come in, uh, let's go to an audience question from Spencer Dung, the CEO of Dorabot in China. Spencer asks, how will the travel industry transform itself if the situation with COVID-19 is prolonged um, for many years? Does it have to prepare indeed for, um, you know, is this the new normal, um, recurring pandemics? If so, how is, how is the industry going to prepare for this? Um, uh, Paul, perhaps we should start with you and, and then perhaps get, a, get the uh, perspective from Shannon. Well, I think, first of all, what we've got to remember, we are a curious race of beings. We climb mountains, we descend into seas, we do all sorts of crazy things to further boundaries. And that's, I think, human spirit. And human spirit, I'm greatly optimistic, will find a way around this, first of all. But the second thing, I want to pick up on what Brian said earlier, and that is the sort of mass customization of the travel and product experience. People will be able to tailor make their travel experiences, I think, on a much more individual basis in the future. And I think this disaggregation that we've seen in so many other industries, taxes, shopping online, uh, shoes, uh, accommodation, you know, all of that is going to shape our world and travel, I think, will be a much more personal uh, tailored product because of the digitization. We can shift the 
uh, fulfillment and marketing into different places and people will have far more choice. So if they want intimacy and they want individuality, they will be able to tailor their travel experiences around that in the future. Shannon? Uh, yes, I completely agree with Paul. I think that is the the future, uh, the next normal for, for travel. I mean, the, the travel business is extremely creative. I think we have um, endured uh, crisis after crisis, and I'm sure there will be crisis, crises that we will face in the future. And I think it is the creativity of those of us in the travel business, as well as that insatiable desire to travel uh, amongst uh, the, the human race, as, as Paul referenced. So I do think that we will continue to find our way uh, forward. I think travel is not going to go away. People will continue to travel. They have a hunger to travel. Um, and I do think personalization, being able to personalize your experience is, is what we can look forward to in the future. And again, in the luxury, luxury segment, this is something that we have been doing uh, for some time. But even, even in the luxury segment, I think we have a, an opportunity to, to move that personalization forward. Um, you know, and I, I think if, I think that is where the future of this industry, hospitality, cruise, air, um, I think travel in general, um, it, that is where the future lies. And that is what the consumer is seeking. That is what the traveler is seeking. So again, you have this, this coming together of um, creativity, consumer demand, and, and we, we will um, define that next normal. Um, and we're doing it now as we speak. So um, while our audience are curious people, as Paul says, and though they have an insatiable desire to travel, as Shannon says, most of them feel comfortable traveling locally where it's safe. And with that, I'm afraid we're out of time. We're going to have to leave it there. Shannon Knapp, Arnold Donnell, and Paul Griffiths, thank you again for joining us today. We're grateful for your participation and your perspectives. I'd also like to extend my thanks to Brian Chesky for taking the time to join our conversation and to our audience, both within and beyond the Bloomberg New Economy community. Thanks for joining us. We're taking a little break in two weeks, but we invite you to our conversation next month on the outlook for trade in an increasingly fractured global economy. That's on Tuesday, July the 28th. Follow the conversation with at New Econ Forum on Twitter or like us on Facebook. And to learn more about other upcoming events, please visit our website at neweconomyforum.com. Thank you and stay well. Mm -hmm.